All right, everybody, welcome back to uh, part two of our Reloading 101 series. Uh, thanks for watching what you could tolerate in the first video, leaving all your comments and stuff down below. Uh, I wanted to cover a couple things before we kind of get into this. Um, one of the big things I saw was decapping before tumbling. Uh, and the reason I don't do that is because I've tried it. I've tried scraping the carbon out of primer pockets and it just never made a difference to me. So what I got here is a second fire batch of brass that I've resized one on and popped the primer out of so you can see. And then uh, some of our bastard box for this video, what we're going to be using, and that is uh, eight fires. So I don't know how well you're going to be able to see it. We'll get a couple pieces out. I'll do what I can here. Might just throw a picture up. But as you can see, they all have carbon in them and they all look exactly the same as the second fire stuff does. So that is why I don't worry about it. You're more than welcome to uh, take the time and scrape them if you want. Uh, or decap and tumble first and go back through again. But it's just something that I have brass with 11, 12 firings on it that I've never scraped the primer pockets out of. And uh, have yet to see any sort of adverse issues from that. Now because I don't have a expander ball in my die, in my sizing die like we talked about, uh, I have a mandrel. Now before you put a primer in, uh, and I like to do it after trimming so that the case mouth is chamfered, uh, I have to run a mandrel through it. What the mandrel is is basically just a tapered uniforming tool that is going to open the case mouths up. Uh, it's going to do basically what the inverse of that neck bushing is doing but it's going to do it the very last step, the last thing that happens, just like when the bullet would go in, it's going to push it out to a specified dimension. One other thing I wanted to mention while we're uh, getting started is that a lot of stuff I am glossing over. Uh, and There's a lot more that does go into it, but for the sake of an intro video, this is all kind of basic stuff that you're going to need to know or need to do to get started. Any fine tuning stuff you can do from there and I'm gonna try and cover in a later video a little bit more detailed on each process. All right, so now that we've got our prepped brass ready for primers, unless you feel the need to scrape the primer pockets, uh, you're gonna to want to go with whatever primers match your primer pockets. So depending on what caliber you have or whose brass you have, uh, you're going to use small or large rifle primers. Um, a lot of times you can get crossed brass that offers small rifle primer in something like a 308 case or in a 6.5 Creed case that would typically use a small rifle primer. So you'll just have to check whatever your brass is and use the primer that matches that. So now you need to prime your brass. Uh, we're gonna get into priming tools, uh, what's available, what you can get, what's necessary. For this video, basically just what you need to get the job done. Uh, a lot of people, still advanced shooters, use uh, something as simple as an RCBS uh, hand primer. I forever used my Forrester Coax. That press actually comes with a priming tool on the top of it, but when I bought my 4190 press, I actually needed um, something else, and I didn't like how the hand primers worked. Um, I did have one when I first started reloading because I didn't have a video like this to follow to show me uh, what was good, what was worth the money. I would have bought one of these had they been available a long time ago. Super fast, super accurate, and uh, once you're not doing the basic stuff, you can get into changing the seating depth of your primers to tune just like you would your seating depth of your bullet. But that's something we'll cover later uh, if we go into a video like that. This is gonna be a uh, 
uh, more so what you want to do for priming whenever you get started uh, not so much my exact process uh, all we're doing here is uh, filling this tube up which is specific for the CPS um, depending on what you're using the handheld primers or something similar they'll have a little tray on them where you'll basically have to flip primers and do this and get them all facing the same direction but that's just how this one works um, basically for priming the only thing until you get to tuning that you want to look out for be careful of is that your primer is flush or preferably below the case head now again this tool is not something that you need just to prime brass all you're worried about priming brass is getting that primer in the primer pocket and if you can feel it below to start out that's all you need that's all you're worried about so we're not going to worry about tuning it tuning seating depth anything like that we're just priming brass getting a primer in the primer pocket and that's it while you're priming you can uh, depending on your tool feel your primer pockets so if you have primers that go in really tight or really loose for tuning purposes as far as tuning your load goes you, know, you can maybe mark those set them aside do whatever um, as your brass gets older and you fired it more and more maybe fired it in the rain um, if you're testing pressure and you get a really high pressure load and you end up at a uh, limit where you're popping primers or pushing primers out um, you know you might feel loose primer pockets so you may you may pitch those pieces so there you go a couple minutes on the uh, CPS and you have all your brass primed uh, I can do about a hundred in about five minutes with this tool uh, guys say that the hand primer is just as fast but I like nice stuff sucker for billet buy whatever fits your budget one other thing I wanted to point out or show is just organization I like to have all my stuff organized I like it to all be clean be able to put it away be able to clean my bench off work on my bench and not get stuff mixed up which for safety in reloading is important uh, you don't want to be you know losing primers hiding them in your carpet getting them sucked up in your vacuum uh, whatever so for my bench I sort of made a system if you will for different tools so I have a uh, super swager from Dylan for getting rid of the crimp and military brass um, same thing the plate for my CPS and all I did was countersunk some screws so I can basically bolt anything to an aluminum plate with this spacing uh, and then bolt this down and remove it and put it away when it's not in use so that when I'm not using it my reloading bench is flat uh, nothing for powder and bullets and whatever to get stuck in uh, and then I have a nice clean surface uh, and I can put everything away and keep it all organized so now we'll talk about powder throwers what are you going to use to throw powder into your case that's the second to last step we got in the process we're almost done uh, there are a ton of different options I bought the RCBS charge master four or five years ago when I first started reloading and haven't upgraded yet uh, you can get crazy expensive couple thousand dollars there's a Prometheus which is five thousand dollars something like that uh, I haven't quite found the need for that yet um, and I know guys that have a manual scale and actually still just use a trickler 
to manually uh, get their charges onto their scale. Um, this goes back to what I said in the beginning. It's all about how much money you have or how much time you have or how much you want to spend to save time. People give me crap for using the Charge Master still with all of the other high-end stuff that I have, um, but there's nothing wrong with it. Something three, four, five times the price might save me a little bit of time, but again, it works for me. I get 15 feet per second extreme spreads, and I have a hard time just fine spending any money to beat that by one, two feet per second, or none, maybe. It may not help at all. Uh, works fine. Never give me any issues. One more thing that people say to do, and I'm not sure that it makes a difference or not, doesn't hurt to do, is uh, to turn your powder thrower on whenever you get down and you plan on reloading or throwing powder. They say turn it on, let it warm up, let the electronics warm up. Whether it makes a difference or not, I don't know. I've just always done it. Always do it. All right, moving on to the nice trays that I told you to buy. Hopefully you did. Hopefully you didn't buy some cheap plastic ones. If you bought these from Area 419, you'll thank me uh, because here's where we set our brass into the trays for loading. Um, nothing fancy here. Just grab a handful, fill it up. Brass set in here. Like I said, they drop in. Don't wiggle. The tray doesn't wiggle. Doesn't bounce around, slide around. So normally I'd fill this whole tray up, maybe another one, load 150. Or if I'm not doing load development, changing my load, I'm just going to grab brass from leftover from another match since it's going to be the same and uh, run that. Now, after we have our brass prime, mandrilled, all set up, ready to go, we're going to move on to seating. So whatever press you have is going to determine, obviously, where your seating die is. There's a lot of other turret presses like this where they have a head with multiple stations for dies. Uh, simple, cheaper, single stage presses like a rock chucker from RCBS, uh, a Lee lock and load. They're going to have basically just one station. So you're going to change your dies out based on what you're using. So these lock rings are really gonna come into play there where you're gonna screw those in, set those, tighten them down, leave them because you're gonna to have to change them out all the time. You may have to go back through and do a little setup or checking. Uh, I don't have one, haven't used one. I, I started with a coax and just upgraded this zero. So I haven't ever had to do that. The coax, they slide in and out of a slot. Um, keeps you from having to adjust them. Works great, super fast, quick to change. I think they're 350 bucks, the Zero right now, they're about 1200 bucks. So that's your press, the Rock Chuckers. I don't even know, but they are extremely affordable and a lot of guys use them. Makes just as good of ammo, just not quite as nice of an experience. So for setup on your seating die, it's going to be something similar to what we did with the sizing die. Depending on whose seating die you have, they're going to have instructions with it on initial setup. It's going to be something similar to running the ram all the way up, screwing the die down, tightening it in the lock ring, and then you're going to adjust with the ultra mic from there. So it's a little trial and error. Maybe if you follow the instructions that they give you, it'll get you closer faster, but the way I like to do it is uh, just sort of trial and error. I'll run the press up a little bit just to get the bullet seated in the neck and see where that gets me. And then I'll either dial the die down or dial the micrometer part down onto the bullet so that it's touching, and then I'll adjust from there. But I'll show you how to do uh, the fine tuning once you, once you get it initially set up. So back over to our rifle, we're gonna do the same thing similar to what we did with the sizing die setup. So we're going to take our firing pin out. If you have a spring ejector, you need to take that spring out, take your roll pin out, uh, because 
we're gonna do the same thing where we're gonna do it by feel. That way you can find the lands exactly and not just use a tool where you may be jamming the bullet into the lands 20 thou, 30 thou, because you can do that without too much effort uh, and not be able to feel it. So having the brass size of the chamber and giving us a no brass feel to the bolt is gonna help us here uh, along with what we're doing here you're going to see how easy it is to see exactly when you're on the lands and uh, when you're off of them so this is a little bit of a tedious process but setups not too terrible and once you get the uh, once you get it started it's just a matter of patience so you obviously want to seat your bullet in your neck whatever bullet you're using you know preferably from the same lot so that your base to ogive measurement your base of the bullet to the ogive where it widens up enough to touch the rifling is going to be the same across whatever bullets you're actually using so that'll vary by lot number depending on your bullet manufacturer so you want to actually check it with the bullets you're going to be using something you are going to want to do this or really doing any reloading is uh, some sort of bullet puller this is a uh, Lyman kinetic bullet puller Basically, all you do is put this collar around the rim of the brass, drop this in here, put the cap on, and you can just whack it on whatever you need to uh, get the bullets to come out of the case. Um, they also have ones that go in your press. I think it's a uh, collet bullet puller. I don't have one. I've just bought the hammer when I started, and uh, for what I've done, it's worked for me, so I haven't experimented with anything else. So back over on the press, uh, I got my die spun back just so we can see um, where we're at as far as our seating depth goes. You can obviously tell that is super long and uh, barely seated in the neck of the case, um, but that's just for testing purposes. We're going to throw it in the chamber and um, see where we're at. If we're close, the rifling is going to push this into the neck where it needs to be, and then we can adjust the die from there. If it's way far out, it's either going to push into the neck, depending on your neck tension, or it's going to get stuck in the barrel, which isn't a huge deal. You can just knock it out with a cleaning rod, and uh, you know you need to screw your die down more. Now that we have our brass size to the chamber, the size that uh, it should be so that it, the bolt closes on the brass like there's nothing in the chamber, we're, all we're going to be able to feel now is the bullet. So I can tell right now it's pushed into the rifling because it's really hard to close. So I push down so I can feel it in there. I can feel it rubbing the lands. Uh, we're going to come up to here and then you're going to hear it click on final open. So basically all we're going to do is seat that bullet further and further down until that click is gone and we'll know right where the lands are. So every rotation of this die is 25 thou. So because that click was still really heavy, I know that we're still pretty far from coming off the lands. So all I'm going to do is uh, seat the bullet 25 thou deeper to uh, expedite this process. You can go as slow as you want, you can go five at a time, ten at a time, whatever you want to do. So still rubbing, I can still feel it, still got a loud click. Focus back in here. Um, I'm going to start going ten at a time just to see it. I can feel it still come up to here still got a hard click I'm gonna take uh, 15 off give it another run check in the chamber okay so I can feel right there that it's quite a bit lighter on close so it's just barely rubbing the click is there 
but a lot lighter. So at this point, we'll start slowing down and we'll go down five thou deeper for the seating depth. Still rubbing lightly. Still at a hard spot here and a small click. So at this point, I'm just gonna go five thousandths at a time. So it starts to drop pretty free. I can still feel a little bit. And I hit a hard stop here. And there's just a faint click to get past. So if it was me, this is at the point where I would take a base to ogive measurement or keep this dummy around. Um, a notebook with measurements, notes, anything at all when you start reloading is good to have, something good to revert back to. Um, but this is where I would call it good. This is where I would say, hey, here's where my lands are. You could go a thou, two thou, three thou, and really find exactly where that click stops. So we'll just go ahead, we'll say at 15 thou down further, is gonna be off the lands. Nothing, no click. Goes all the way up, no hard stop. So this is at the point where we know exactly where our land's at. This round is sized exactly to our chamber and the bullet, the exact bullet we're gonna use from that lot of bullets is also seated to our lands where they're at. It's not jammed into it 30 thou, it's not out 30 thou, it's exactly where they're at, as exact as you wanna get as far as the measurement. It's super repeatable, you can try that five different times and you'll get the same measurement. So what I'm gonna do is show how to measure that with a pair of calipers and with the tool if you wanted to do that. So for measuring a bullet off of the ogive, which is the important measurement. You'll hear a lot of guys measure um, overall length, which is fine, and it gives you some sort of measurement to go off of, but the tip is really irrelevant in what you're loading. What you want to know is the O drive of the bullet, the wide part of the bullet, where it contacts the rifling. You want to know how far that is. Now, I know some guys will say, don't worry about the lands, measure base of the case to the tip of the bullet and change that measurement. Um, the problem with that is the tips can change if you have a uh, open tip bullet. The bullet where it's crimped will have a varying height. So your tip height might be 10 thousandths different. Just to demonstrate that, this is some ammo I have loaded for my uh, Mark 12. And it's not anywhere near the same as what my dasher is as far as accuracy, so I don't worry about it too much. Um, and since it is an AR, I do worry about the mag length. So these are 2.264 inches on this one. 2 2.2660. 2 2 2 so right there we have everywhere from 2.260 to a 2 2.275. So if you're measuring off of the tip, you have no idea where things are at. All you know is where the tip of the bullet is relative to the base of the case, which if you're trying to tune your load based on seating depth, that doesn't help you at all. The proper way to do this is with a datum dial kit. This one's from Forrester. I'm sure, like everything else, somebody makes a ton of different versions, but this one's uh, super nice. And I started with all Forrester stuff when I started, so I just have a lot of that. So right here on the face, 
you can see that just says 243 cal on it uh, since we're using a 243 bullet. So this kit comes with three different dials and it lets you see, there we go, it lets you choose what bullet diameter you're working with. So since we're going to go with a 243 on this one, we will spin it around to the 243 slot and we can measure the ogive of the bullet there. If you want to measure your bullets before you load them, you can do that too. You can measure the base to ogive. Uh, and I'll measure a couple of those just to show you how it works. Uh, just like everything else, or every other tool I should say. You put in your calipers, tighten it down. You want to zero it out. And then you want to put your bullet in there. Make sure it's square. That gives us a .667 base to ogive on that bullet. So the base is uh, gonna go against the jaw of the caliper and the ogive is gonna go in the datum dial kit where it shows it. So that is a 6695. Again, for PRS versus bench rest, you're going to do varying amounts of uh, detail. So a bench rest guy might s sort these by size. He might weigh them. Um, but this isn't really something that we're super concerned with. 666. Might want to throw that one away. And that one is 666. So you can see how much more of a consistent measurement that is versus measuring base to tip on an open tip bullet where the tip height itself won't change a lot. I know we're getting a little bit more detailed than uh, basic reloading for this, but I just want you to understand whenever you hear people talk about overall length, ogive, based ogive, case based ogive, there's a bunch of terms um, and uh, how they affect what you're measuring. So if you don't just want to keep the case as a dummy round and you want to measure, just for your notes, we're going to have our dummy round at 1.852 inches on the lands with this bullet, with this specific lot of bullet. Something to write down, notes to keep. You can save this. That way, if you ever change your dies, you can just measure this, set your bullet back up real quick, get this measurement to match, and uh, you'll be ready to go from there. So we found our lands, got our base measurement, wrote it down in our notebook, and for the purpose of beginning reloading, all we're going to do is push our bullet back 30 thousands off the lands. That's a pretty good general starting point for pretty much every bullet, regardless of shape uh, and what caliber or what you're shooting. Um, you can fine tune from there. But for what we're going to do and how I do it, I never bother doing load development or seeding depth test. I find my lands, go back 30 thousandths or 50 thousandths, and call it good. You don't want to jam your bullet in case you need to pull it out of your chamber. You don't want the bullet getting hung in the lands and uh, dumping powder in your chamber, all over your trigger, inside your action, inside your magazine, all over the other rounds. So. For PRS or anything but bench rest shooting, you're going to want to jump your bullet. Okay, now that we've got our seating depth figured out, or at least a starting point, uh, move on to what powder and charging your cases. So what powder you're going to use depends on what chamber you're shooting or what cartridge you're shooting and what bullet you're going to be shooting. Uh, any bullet manufacturer powder manufacturer can give you starting points for what you're going to be shooting. This is a list of powders um, suitable for a 308 with a 175 grain, 180 grain um, Sierra bullet specifically. 
So they're going to give you minimum and maximum, or they're going to give you a starting point. Uh, Sierra's starting point for 308, for Varget at least, is extremely low, but it doesn't hurt to start low. The Lyman book for Varget, their starting grains is just a hair under what Sierra says. So reference a couple pieces of material. You can check forums, you can check Facebook, you can check whatever reloading groups uh, to find a good reference or a good starting point. And a lot of people say, yeah, here's my pet load for it. You can use that, but with even whatever you're going off with the manual, back it down a little bit and work up to what they're suggesting to make sure it's safe in your chamber. As you get into a little more advanced reloading or maybe like right now, powder availability is really scarce, so you might not be able to find a certain powder on this list, so you might want to try something else. So you can always look through. There's multiple, uh, multiple selections of powder. You can try something, or you can just experiment to see if something gives you more temp stability or better groups um, or a bigger tuning window for your load. So because we're shooting a six dasher, we're loading for six dasher, um, and we're going to be using Varget. I already know what the load development is. Uh, we're shooting a 109 hybrid. And we're going to be shooting Varget. So, for example, my load I've already established is 32.2 grains of Varget. If you don't know what you're going to shoot, what you should do is take your minimum or your 10% less than maximum book load and start there. So, 6 Dasher is not a Sammy spec cartridge, so there's no book load for it. So, we'll just make up and say that 32 grains is book max. So what we're going to want to do is load all of our charge weights up. We're going to do an optimized charge weight test, OCW. And what we're going to do is we're going to start low. So we're going to start at 30 grains of Argot, 30.5, 31, 31.5, 32, 32.5, 33. And we'll just stop at 33. We think that's where we're gonna get more than enough velocity for what we need. Again, that's information. Do a little bit of research on what you're shooting and you'll easily be able to find all of that. Three at 33. And depending on your range availability, uh, you might want to load more, you might want to check groups along with velocity, along with pressure. So maybe you'll multiply all that by two so that you can shoot three for speed and three for a group, or five for speed, five for a group. If it's easier for you to do that and go to the range once, like it is for me, I'll do that and then I can pull them apart when I get home, the ones I don't need. So uh, that's what you would do for optimum charge weight testing. Um, we know that 32.2 for my gun is what it wants. So we're just gonna load that and I'll show you how that is done on the Charge Master. So now this has been turned on for however long, five, 10, 15 minutes. Um, what we're gonna wanna do is take our powder and pour it into our hopper. Depending on what powder thrower you're using, um, your hopper setup is going to be different. If you're using a manual hand trickler, that's going to be different. But for this, just a hopper at the top, I like to fill it up most of the way to the top. Put your lid on your powder and put it away, get it out of your way. So this part here is Charge Master specific. Um, Pull your pan off the top, and what you want to do, they send you two check weights. So you're going to calibrate it, 
and I do this every time. I know some people don't. Uh, it says zero grams and it's stable. You're gonna hit calibrate again. 50, so you're gonna put just the 50 check weight on there. Wait for the stable to pop up. Hit calibrate again. Put the second check weight on there because it's calling for 100. Calibrate again. It says 100. I like to pull one off. Make sure it still says 50. And then you are good to go. It'll switch over to grains. Take your tray. Put it on there. Note that weight. 136.2. Zero that out. And now you have zero. So you're ready to throw. So based on what we did with our cases or with our charge weight test, we now know that we want to do uh, 32.2 grains. So we're going to type in 32.2. And most of your uh, powder throwers are going to be about the same as far as this goes. Um, you're going to type it in, hit dispense. That's gonna run, depending on your powder thrower, it's gonna be faster or slower. And it's gonna trickle the last bit in. And there's 32.2. It's gonna check it, make sure it's stable, and you're ready to throw into your case. Another really nice piece of kit that you'll need, you'll need to obviously throw the powder in the case. You're not just gonna use the tip of your pan to try and catch it inside of the mouth of a small little six mil or 22 cal case. So you can buy a cheap plastic funnel, a um, couple bucks. They work fine, but the powder does static cling to it. Another really nice product from Area 419 is their billet funnel system. The nice thing about that is that you can change the cap. You can see I have one for 308, 223, and for 6 mil here. So I'm going to take my 6 millimeter cap, screw it on, set it on my case, and take my powder off, pour it in, now the charge master has an auto dispense, so as soon as you put the tray back on and it senses zero, it's gonna start throwing again. So once you got your powder thrown into your case, what I always do for each one is as soon as I do that, before I move on, is I put a bullet in the neck. Move the funnel over the next one, throw your powder in, back on the tray, move the funnel, bullet in the neck, funnel on the next case. What that does is keep you from skipping a case and loading a bullet on top of an empty case, keeps you from double charging a case, and it keeps you from spilling powder into a case that already has powder in it should you fumble the pan full of powder. Uh, which will happen, you will, spin, you will spill powder, uh, but that way you don't have to go back and check the cases that you've already loaded because you know that the bullet is in the neck and it's already got that case sealed up. Dump your powders, set your bullets in, and repeat 50, 100, 150, 200 times, however much ammo you need to make. Uh, once we're done with this, run over to the press, seat your bullet in to your specified depth, and you have your ready to go ammo. So from here, you're gonna bring your charged cases over to your press. You've already got your seating depth set with your 30, 20, 50 thou jump from the lens. And uh, until we get to tuning that part, you're just going to run those up, seat your bullet, and you are done. We are ready to go to the range, test these out, uh, plan on loading up the rest of those 
we're going to check speed, uh, check group size, check zero, and then we're also going to check them out at distance. Um, probably run a stage, uh, just show how they perform. Hopefully everybody that said in part one that uh, this was wrong, that was wrong, sticks around, they can see the results and see how uncomplicated uh, reloading actually needs to be. It doesn't have to be some super scientific thing, um, or complicated thing I should say. You can get away with pretty simple reloading practices, especially shooting PRS, Pinterest or something. You might need a little bit more, but really pretty minimal equipment and uh, minimal know-how. Thanks to the internet, you can get away with more than good enough ammo to be competitive and uh, get whatever you want done. So thanks for uh, following along. Stay tuned for part three and uh, we'll see you at the range.